Good evening, everyone. Time for another silver update. This is the daily chart of silver US dollar. Let's pull out to say the 30 minute. So this trend line, this rising trend line that I've drawn in here, probably want to pull out to the hourly to see the whole thing. So I said on the last video, I talked about the price action and indicated that at some point we'd have a resolution of the downtrend line, uptrend line in this $30 line here. And we resolved to the downside. You can see that when it broke through, it broke through pretty significantly. It wasn't on tremendous volume. Dipped, had a little rally, and then you can see we recently dipped down this line that I have drawn here, this is 28.50. So at about 28.50, we bounced not very strongly and pull up the indicator. So it's a fairly strong bounce, but I think if we pull back to the two hour, it'll show it a little bit better. So it's a bounce in the indicator on the two hour coincides with this. The last bounce we had was here. We had one here, and a couple here and here, and then one back here. So it's not working as far as a buy signal, but it is uh, a signal to the upside. So we'll see if we bounce off this 2850. Been talking about that 2850 level because this area in here is established as the kind of support. So we didn't get it slicing like a knife through butter as I was thinking might happen, but we, we cut down quickly and then hit this 2850. So in the next few days, my just gut prediction is that we're going to rally from here just because of the oversold nature of this indicator and the fact that it's crossed over to the positive. But we could easily dump more tomorrow. So I'm going to give it about 70-30 that we're going to rally from here until we test these other lines uh, probably until we test 30, but we might just be a test of this uptrend line and then a reversal. So I'd give it a 70% chance we're going to test 29, maybe a 60% chance we'll test 30, and, and then about a 30% chance we'll just uh, rally a little bit and then dump from here. If we do dump from here, it's quite an air pocket down you can see that the next support comes in around tw that 20 important 26 level. So if you get through 2850, we might revisit 26. Is that a big deal? No, I don't think it's really a big deal. I mean, you have to believe you have to believe in the fundamentals or you either believe in the fundamentals or you don't. Um, if if you don't believe in the fundamentals, then no price is going to be a low enough price to convince you to buy. If you believe in the fundamentals, then you're going to want to buy the dips. And the kind of dips I buy, I like to buy, are usually when blood is running in the streets. So a very, very high volume drop, something like this, and kind of a reversal situation, it's usually the best time to buy. Usually occurs on a Sunday night, I've found, but we'll see. Uh, so the next thing I want to look at is this cable and we know that uh, Julian Assange apparently was, I think he cut a deal for time served. So I believe he's returned to Australia. Uh, the rumors are that one part of the deal was that they would delete the uh, emails, the big controversial email uh, files. Maybe that was a deal cut with the DNC. I'm not sure that's a rumor. But this is still up, and it's the WikiLeaks. I'm sure you've probably heard of it. It's called London Wholesale Gold Dealers Views on U.S. Gold Sale and Private U.S. Ownership. So this is a conversation. I encourage you to read the entire thing just because of the language, and I'll read a bit of it here. I don't really have any reason to think this isn't real. And this is described as limited official use. And this was supposedly dispatched 
December 10th, 1974. So this time frame is a time frame where they have the, the U.S. a number of years earlier rescinded their redemption of gold by foreigners. Now, it, it was illegal for Americans to own gold, but foreigners could redeem their dollars for gold. So that had been suspended when Nixon closed the gold window. The petrodollar had emerged and now the legalization of gold ownership by Americans, because if you remember, they made it against the law for Americans to own gold bullion. I know that is, I can't believe that law stood. Uh, that is so against the spirit of the Constitution. I, I don't know how that wasn't struck down, but it wasn't. It came out of the New Deal and a lot of unconstitutional things happened. But... Uh, so let's read a little bit of this. It came out in 1974, right before uh, the gold futures markets were created. Begin summary. The announced auction of official gold by the U.S. Treasury was praised by London gold dealers as being timely and highly contributory to a more stable market. Some fear, however, that should a single bid for the entire 2 million ounces be forthcoming, prices might increase rapidly possibly as high as $250 an ounce. Now, gold at that time was 35 bucks, So that's a big move, almost tenfold, maybe whatever, sevenfold or sixfold. Uh, so they're saying that what was available was 2 million ounces of gold. And what they're worried about is that one country might come. They'll mention that here. So they say they anticipate major impact of U.S. ownership will be the formation of sizable gold futures market, but rather small demand for physical holding of gold other than coins after a brief initial surge following deregulation. In London, to private ownership of gold by Americans, sorry, in connection with visit of GAO team serving limited official use, it seems to kind of just start out of the blue, but anyway, Announced auction of gold by U.S. Treasury. While the underlying reasons differed, the consensus of the dealers was that the move by the U.S. was laudable. In most cases, they stated that the action was unexpected. The timing of the decision was praised as being foresighted. Announcement of the sale prior to January 1st, 1975 date was viewed as timely since there is mounting evidence that much of the recent increase in the price of traded gold has resulted from anticipation of a large American demand following the deregulation date even though the dealers themselves expect the physical demand to be rather short-lived. This much said, a recurring comment both in conversation with the gold dealers as well as in numerous telephone calls received by the embassy is that if one buyer or more likely one buyer from a particular country, Kuwait was often cited, decides to place a bid for the entire 2 million ounces of U.S. gold being auctioned either at market prices or possibly at higher than market prices, then the effect of the U.S. auction, which is initially viewed as having stabilizing force on market prices, would be the opposite. Dealers stated that should such a single bid be accepted by the U.S., then the market would interpret this as a signal that heretofore unrecognized demand was present and prices would increase rapidly, possibly as high as $250 per ounce. In the dealer's view, the only counteraction to the above hypothetical situation would be for an immediate announcement of an additional sale of like or larger quantities to dealers with whom we spoke stated that to that date there had been no significant activity in the gold markets by official monetary authorities of Arab countries. They also expressed the view that should market conditions indicate the prices may rise rapidly in the near term. A large volume of purchase from oil producing areas should not be totally discounted or unexpected. While most dealers did not foresee a large Arab demand for gold to be held as official reserves, they did see demand from oil producing areas with Middle East residents being potential active traders in the gold market, especially in the absence of official sales to stabilize price. In reply to question, they were not clear whether this type of activity might come from official authorities or from private sources, but reiterated the idea that the oil-producing areas were the only ones with sufficient funds 
to make large physical gold purchases in current market conditions. Now this is the main section that we're interested in here for silver. Uh, and this is just about gold, but it's the same principle. The major impact of private US ownership according to limited official use. Now limited official use, limited official use is information that is unclassified information of a sensitive proprietary or personally private nature which must be protected against release to unauthorized individuals and this term is prescribed for use within the department to signify such information information which impacts the national security of the united states is classified confidential secret or top secret so this is not classified material, but it is limited official use. In other words, they don't want people knowing about this communication. They don't want the public to know that this was what they were doing in secret. So to the dealer's expectations will be the formation of a sizable gold futures market. I think uh, oh, already went over that. No, that wasn't it. Sorry. To the dealer's expectations will be the formation of a sizable gold futures market. Each of the dealers expressed the belief that the futures market would be of significant proportion and physical trading would be minuscule by comparison. Also expressed was the expectation that large volume futures dealing would create a highly volatile market. In turn, the vol price movements would diminish the initial demand for physical holding and most likely negate long-term hoarding by U.S. citizens. You see that? That's the term they use, hoarding. If you're a silver stacker, they consider you a hoarder. That's not a good implication for uh, an emergency situation. It's, isn't that funny that they don't say that Billionaires like Jeff Bezos hoard dollars or Bill Gates. Bill Gates is a hoarder of money. But no, if someone wants to protect themselves with gold or silver, they're a hoarder. As to future demand by U.S. citizens for gold, most dealers did not foresee demand for physical holding as significant with the exception of an initial surge. First two or three months following a year of deregulation, they did not feel that U.S. citizens on the whole were psychologically prepared to switch from small-scale gold coin purchases to large-scale long-term bullion hoarding. Several expressed the view that the demand for coins after initial surge would most likely be such that it could be met from within should the U.S. decide to mint gold coins. And then you know that we ended up getting, in 1986, uh, I'm not sure if 86 uh, was the beginning of both the gold and silver eagle. I know it was the first year of the silver eagle. So they did exactly that. So... This is uh, definitely a big smoking gun telling you why they created these futures markets because they expected a tiny amount of the real commodity to trade and uh, they could control the price with the paper. And that's exactly what they did and that's exactly what they are doing. Uh, the other was, was the recent comment uh, by one of the officials about silver where he said, well, it looks like we need to tamp down. Uh, and they were, they were talking about tamping down on the silver price. And if you think about that word, that tamp, that has the same root as tamper. We know what tampering is. Uh, basically, we're talking about government interfering in free markets. And as I said before in the last video, that's the basis behind all the evil in the economic world is government interference in free markets. Free markets and free trade create wealth for citizens. In fact, the inflation that we're seeing is um, not the natural order. The natural order of things is deflation as productivity rises and technology rises. If you have stable money, then the share of wealth becomes greater and greater for every citizen as their money is able to buy more productive goods. They can get more productive goods for less money. That's a natural deflationary growing economy, which is what the United States had, as so many have pointed out, for about 100 years or 150 years. 
before the creation of the Federal Reserve. Yes, there were booms and busts, but it's almost always because of the interference of government. So, now I wanted to talk about silver and stacking silver. A lot of the talk for stacking silver has been people talking about in, uh, silver as an inflation hedge. Now, if we look at, let me actually pull up the channel. Um, if we look at what silver stackers will tell you or what people who stack gold will tell you is that they are looking to hedge for inflation. But actually, precious metals are even more valuable as a default hedge. Everybody thinks of them as an inflation hedge, but the other scenario that we could have is a default. And I was going to play a video on that, but we don't have time. So if we think about silver as a default hedge, uh, for example, let's look at Costco. Now there's a lot of stocks that I track. Costco is a particularly good one because it's really had a run up. So if you look at the chart of Costco and pull it out to the weekly, you can see here that this is, it's rounding up in a, a sort of exponential growth rise. And we know from the past that those are almost always met with a crash. You can see that the steepness of the rise just grows each time. And this goes back quite a ways. I think the price of Costco back in 1987 was about two bucks. So we've gone from two bucks to 850. So that's a really big move. Is that more than inflation? I think so. That's quite a bit more than inflation. But so, there's a lot of signs that people with other YouTube channels and, and alternative media are talking about, for example, the fake jog numbers, uh, the increase in uh, the fake um, unemployment numbers. People are talking about the prices of things and how they're running out of money. Uh, a lot of these things can lead to a collapse or it can be the a withering away of the capital that these banks have because of interest rate rises. And you just have to remember that they can decide to collapse the system. They don't have to hyperinflate their way out of the system. In 1929, they decided to let it collapse and the stock market went down, I believe, 90%. And, and that's when they confiscated the gold and then again, we show from that uh, memo there, uh, they're planning now on letting Americans own it again. So for a good, uh, I don't, I think the gold ownership out was outlawed in 1933. So about 40 years where Americans could not own gold bullion. And then they legalized it. So if you remember when they took the gold, in 1933, they immediately revalued it. So they had everybody turn in their gold and paid them $20, and then they revalued the gold to $35 an ounce, and they made it illegal for Americans to own it, just foreigners to redeem it. So that uh, the reason I bring up that example is that that was where people were protected by gold and silver as well from a deflationary collapse. Remember, in a deflationary collapse, you have a collapse of counterparty promises. And that's what our entire system is. That pretty much, is, when someone says it's a derivative, it's, uh, it's just a form of a, a counterparty risk. It, it just means that it's a bet based on something else and someone else is going to pay you the money. Uh, that goes for stocks, bonds, um, annuities, uh, any kind of debt, 
Uh, anything where one party can renege, and when the part that party reneges, then the other party is out of luck or has to go through a bank's bankruptcy and get a percentage rather than being paid in full. So physical silver and physical gold are a default protection. That's how they operated in the Great Depression. And I, it's a possibility that may be how they operate in the future. It's not just a hedge against inflation. Although silver, a lot of people have said that silver is a terrible hedge against inflation, it, it certainly hasn't performed as well as a hedge against inflation as, for example, the shares of Costco or the shares of Microsoft. Uh, but that, that we've had a financial inflation. But silver has gone from approximately four bucks to fifty. Um, so that's you know an eleven fold move. Now it's fallen back. But that's definitely not what we see in some stocks. Some are 500 or 1,000 fold move. But remember, that's just select stocks. So you have to buy them when they're nothing. You have to hold them the entire time. And very few people, very few people guess right. There were people who bought Amazon early. You know, we can look at Amazon. And back, you know, when Amazon first started, it was 12 cents a share. And now it's 193. So that's more than a thousand bagger there. That's definitely much better than silver and gold have performed over the same period of time. But you have to remember that's just one stock and there's only a handful that perform like that. Uh, maybe... There have been 10 or 20 in the last 10 or 15 years that have given those kinds of returns. Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, a couple of others, maybe NVIDIA. Uh, but if you didn't bet correctly, then you didn't see any returns like that. Silver and gold, on the other hand, uh, and, and by the way, uh, I'm going to, in the future, try to cover the great taking uh, which talks about these sorts of issues. But again, these are promises. These stock certificates are just promises uh, from one party to another, and those parties can renege. So silver and gold have always been, in my mind, more of a default hedge than an inflation hedge. It's the type of asset that you want to have when... Everybody is defaulting and the counterparty is walking away and you're not getting paid what you're owed. Silver isn't, physical silver and physical gold are not owed to anyone if you hold it in your hand. Uh, same is true in a limited way of cryptocurrencies, but definitely true if, if you do it the right way and have the right ones. But uh, it's absolutely true of silver and gold and of course that's the appeal. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about how much money that is. Now for gold, there's quite a bit of gold out there and the price is pretty high, but for silver, let's look at personal consumption expenditures. Just for example, just pick one thing, gambling. Now there's a bunch of things I picked. I looked at drugs, I looked at prostitution, I looked at pornography, I looked at all the things that people waste money on. And this is, I'm just gonna look at gambling. So you can see this chart uh, Americans, I think it looks like in 1990, late late 80s, they spent 20 billion a year on gambling, and now the figure is almost 200, so it's gone almost tenfold from there. But uh, let's think about how much this would buy. So let's say we're talking about 200 billion dollars. How many ounces of silver would 200 billion dollars buy? Well, at 30 dollars silver, would you say 33 dollars silver? Uh, is that 6 billion ounces? I think it's 6 billion ounces. So uh, if just 10% of the gambling money was put into physical silver, that would be 600 million. That would be basically the entire yearly mining almost, which is 800. So, and th there are many other things that people spend their money on. 
So it's very easy uh, to see how if people get spooked, and, and remember, that was the whole purpose of this. This is like a discussion amongst these manipulators and their fear of either an independent country or individuals taking delivery of the asset. That's something they don't want. They want to make control, maintain control with their fake money and they don't want people using real money. And so the importance of this cable, it, it can't be emphasized enough. This is a smoking gun proving that the powers that be from the very beginning created the futures market for the purpose of suppressing and controlling prices and for discouraging what they call hoarding, which means discouraging people from taking action to protect themselves from the machinations of governments and their fake currencies. And we'll talk to you next time.